Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr. and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. China told Indonesia to stop drilling for oil and natural gas in maritime territory that both countries claim. The unusual demand is the latest in a series of disputes over natural resources between the two countries. The Reuters news agency reported that four people who knew about the matter said the dispute over an area in the South China Sea grew tense for months earlier this year. The South China Sea is considered to be rich in resources and an important pathway to international shipping traffic. One letter from Chinese diplomats to Indonesia's foreign ministry clearly told Indonesia to halt operations at a temporary ocean drilling structure. The letter said the drilling was taking place in Chinese territory. Muhammad Farhan, an Indonesian lawmaker on Parliament's National Security Committee, said he was informed about the letter. Our reply was very firm, that we are not going to stop the drilling because it is our sovereign right, Farhan told Reuters. A spokesman for Indonesia's foreign ministry said, Any diplomatic communication between states is private in nature, and its content cannot be shared. China's embassy in Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, did not answer a request for comment. Three other people, who said they were told about the matter, confirmed the letter. Two of those people said China made repeated demands that Indonesia stop drilling. This year's dispute took place in the Tuna Block area of the South China Sea. Indonesia says the southern part of the South China Sea is its exclusive economic zone under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It named the area the North Natuna Sea in 2017. China's claim in the South China Sea is marked by what is known as the nine-dash line on its maps. However, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague in 2016 found that China's claimed boundary had no legal basis. It, the letter, was a bit threatening because it was the first effort of China's diplomats to push their nine-dash line agenda against our rights under the law of the sea, Farhan told Reuters. China is Indonesia's biggest trade partner. It is also the country's second-largest provider of investment. Farhan said that China, in a separate letter, also protested against the mainly land-based military exercises with the U.S. in August. 
The exercises involved 4,500 troops from the United States and Indonesia. They have been held since 2009. On June 30, the Indonesian noble Clyde Boudreau semi-submersible drilling structure, or rig, arrived at the Tuna Block in the Natuna Sea. It was to drill two test wells. Within days, a Chinese Coast Guard ship came, and an Indonesian Coast Guard ship soon arrived. China's foreign ministry told Reuters that its ship was carrying out normal patrol activities in waters under Chinese jurisdiction. It did not answer questions about communications with Indonesia over the drilling. China's defense ministry did not answer requests for comment. But over the next four months, Chinese and Indonesian ships followed each other around the oil and gas field. The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative reported that a Chinese research ship, Haiyang Dijer 10, arrived in the area in late August. It spent most of the next seven weeks in a disputed area known as the D-Alpha Block. Indonesian government studies value the resources there at $500 billion. On September 25th, the American aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan came within 13 kilometers of the Tuna Block drilling rig, and local fishermen said four Chinese warships were also deployed to the area. China is in negotiations with ten Southeast Asian states, including Indonesia, on a code of conduct for the South China Sea. The talks are taking place through the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The work restarted this year after being stopped because of the coronavirus health crisis. China's increasingly aggressive activity in the South China Sea has concerned Indonesia. But Farhan told Reuters that its government did not want to discuss the recent tensions publicly. Leaders wanted to be as silent as possible because, if it was leaked to any media, it would create a diplomatic incident, he said. The temporary rig operated until November 19th. After that time, it went to Malaysian waters. A spokesman for Britain's Harbour Energy, the operator of the Tuna Block, said the drilling was completed on time. In a similar dispute with China in 2017, Vietnam gave up exploration activities. Harbor Energy is expected to release an update on the drilling results on December 9th. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Several big automakers recently announced plans to keep investing in hydrogen vehicle technology. The plans come even as many industry experts 
believe the technology faces a major uphill battle to compete against battery-powered electric cars. Hydrogen-powered cars are also known as fuel cell electric vehicles, or FCEVs. With these vehicles, fuel cells convert hydrogen gas into electricity. This differs from electric vehicles, or EVs, which get their power from a built-in battery. Last month, the chief of Japan's Toyota Motors, Akio Toyota, attended a race that demonstrated an experimental hydrogen vehicle. The vehicle contained a traditional gasoline-powered engine that had been converted to run on hydrogen. Toyota told reporters at the event such conversions could keep traditional internal combustion engines running in a carbon-free world. This, he said, could avoid the need to completely leave behind internal combustion and save millions of auto industry jobs. The enemy is carbon, not internal combustion engines, Toyota said. We shouldn't just focus on one technology, but make use of the technologies we already possess. Toyota recently launched the second-generation model of its Mirai hydrogen vehicle and has plans to offer several more models in the coming years. In Germany, BMW and Volkswagen Group are both developing hydrogen-powered passenger vehicles along with a series of new EVs. BMW said last month it has developed a hydrogen prototype based on its X5 model in a project partly financed by the German government. Jürgen Guldner is a vice president who heads BMW's hydrogen car development. He told Reuters the company plans to build about 100 hydrogen test vehicles in 2022. Officials at South Korean automaker Hyundai have also spoken about the importance of continuing to explore hydrogen-based vehicles along with developing EVs. The company currently sells a passenger fuel cell vehicle called the Nexo. And Hyundai announced in September it plans to offer hydrogen fuel cell versions for all its commercial vehicles, such as large transport trucks and buses, by 2028. In fuel cell technology, hydrogen combines with oxygen to produce electrical power. It is considered clean energy because the process only releases water and steam into the atmosphere. This makes the technology a good candidate for helping the world reduce its carbon emissions. Currently, however, most of the hydrogen produced worldwide is made using natural gas or coal, both of which cause pollution. Supporters of the technology expect that to change over time. They say the growing use of electricity from wind and solar energy will be able to separate hydrogen and oxygen in water. Those production methods, however, are more costly. Hydrogen-powered vehicles can fuel up in minutes compared to much longer charging times required for EVs. But because the technology is so new, very few hydrogen filling stations exist. Hydrogen fuel cell cars have a driving range of about 480 kilometers, which is much higher than most EVs. 
but the ranges for EVs are expected to keep getting longer as battery technology improves. Another major difference is cost. While many EVs currently on the market are priced starting at around thirty thousand dollars, most fuel cell vehicles start at about fifty thousand. Currently, there are about seven thousand five hundred hydrogen fuel cell cars on the road in the U.S. Most of them in California. That state has just forty-five public fueling stations, but more are planned or are being built. Industry experts say these are all reasons why hydrogen-powered passenger vehicles have a long way to go to effectively compete with EVs. In the United States, the technology is much further developed. For commercial transport vehicles such as buses and heavy trucks, many large commercial manufacturers, including General Motors, Volvo, and Daimler, have heavily invested in hydrogen to power the clean running vehicles. I'm Brian Lynn. <laughs> Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. The Civil War ended in 1865. After that, tensions grew between Congress and the new president, Andrew Johnson. The Republican Party was still new; it was formed to oppose slavery. Radical members of the party controlled Congress. They wanted strong policies to punish the Southern states that left the Union and lost the war. Standing in the way of the Republicans was Andrew Johnson, a Democrat. The president opposed radical efforts to force solutions on the South. He vetoed a number of programs that he thought interfered with rights given to the states by the Constitution. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe continue the story of President Andrew Johnson. In the congressional elections of 1866, radicals won firm control. Of both houses of Congress, they were able to pass a number of bills over the president's veto, but Johnson refused to stand aside in the face of radical attempts to seize all powers of government. This conflict between Johnson and the Congress caused much bitterness. Finally. The radicals decided to get him out of the way. For the first time in American history, Congress would try to remove the president from office. Under the United States Constitution, the House of Representatives has the power to bring charges against the president. The Senate acts as the jury. To decide if the president is guilty of the charges, the Chief Justice of the United States serves as judge. If two thirds of the senators find the president guilty, he can be removed from office. Radicals in the House of Representatives brought eleven charges against President Johnson. Most of the charges were based on Johnson's removal from office of his Secretary of War. Radicals charged that this violated a new law. 
The law said the president could not remove a cabinet officer without approval by the Senate. Johnson refused to recognize the law. He said it was not constitutional. Radicals in the House of Representatives also charged Johnson with criticizing Congress. They said his statements dishonored Congress and the presidency. The great impeachment trial began on March 5th, 1868. The president refused to attend, but his lawyers were there to defend him. One by one, the senators swore an oath to be just. They promised to make a fair and honest decision on the guilt or innocence of Andrew Johnson. A congressman from Massachusetts opened the case for the radicals. He told the senators not to think of themselves as members of any court. He said the Senate was a political body that was being asked to settle a political question. Was Johnson the right man for the White House? He said it was clear that Johnson wanted to overthrow Congress. Other radical Republicans then joined him in condemning Johnson. They made many charges, but they offered little evidence to support the charges. Johnson's lawyers called for facts instead of emotion. They said the Constitution required the radicals to prove that the president had committed serious crimes. Andrew Johnson had committed no crime, they said. This was purely a political trial. They warned of serious damage to the American form of government if the president was removed for political reasons. No future president would be safe, they said, if opposed by a majority of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. The trial went on day after day. The decision would be close. Fifty-four senators would be voting. Thirty-six votes of guilty were needed to remove the president from office. It soon became clear that the radicals had 35 of these votes. Only seven senators remained undecided. If one of the seven voted guilty, Johnson would be removed. Radicals put great pressure on the seven men. They tried to buy their votes. Party leaders threatened them. Supporters in the senators' home states were told to write hundreds of letters demanding that Johnson be found guilty. A senator from Maine was one who felt the pressure, but he refused to let it force him to do what others wished. He answered one letter this way, Sir, I wish you and all my other friends to know that I, not they, am sitting in judgment upon the President. I, not they, have sworn to do impartial justice. I, not they, am responsible to God and man for my action and its results. A senator from Kansas was another who refused to let pressure decide his vote. He said, I trust that I shall have the courage to vote as I judge best. In the final days before the vote, six of the seven remaining Republican senators let it be known that they would vote 
not guilty. But the senator from Kansas still refused to say what his vote would be. His was the only vote still in question. His vote would decide the issue. Now the pressure on him increased. His brother was offered $20,000 for information about how the senator would vote. Everywhere he turned, he found someone demanding that he vote guilty. The vote took place on May 16th. Every seat in the big Senate room was filled. The chief justice began to call on the senators. One by one, they answered, guilty or not guilty. Finally, he called the name of the senator from Kansas. The senator stood up. He looked about him. Every voice was still. Every eye was upon him. It was like looking down into an open grave, he said later. Friendship, position, wealth, everything that makes life desirable to an ambitious man were about to be swept away by my answer. He spoke softly. Many could not hear him. The chief justice asked him to repeat his vote. This time, the answer was clearly heard across the room. Not guilty. The trial was all but done. Remaining senators voted as expected. The chief justice announced the result. On the first charge, 35 senators voted that President Johnson was guilty. 19 voted that he was not guilty. The radicals had failed by one vote. When the Senate voted on the other charges, the result was the same. The radicals could not get the two-thirds majority they needed. President Johnson was declared not guilty. Radical leaders and newspapers bitterly denounced the small group of Republican senators who refused to vote guilty. They called them traitors. Friends and supporters condemned them. None was re-elected to the Senate or to any other government office. It was a heavy price to pay, and yet they were sure they had done the right thing. The senator from Kansas told his wife, The millions of men cursing me today will bless me tomorrow for having saved the country from the greatest threat it ever faced. He was right. The trial of Andrew Johnson was an important turning point in the making of the American nation. His removal from office would have established the idea that the president could serve only with the approval of Congress. The president would have become, in effect, a prime minister. He would have to depend on the support of Congress to remain in office. Johnson's victory kept alive the idea of an independent presidency. However, the vote did not end the conflict between Congress and the White House over the future of the South. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 